Barbing barbu. There was a viral tweet recently. It's something along the lines of a woman's notes app holds more mystery, more intrigue, more truths than any film. Listen, I don't know exactly what it means, but I do know that my notes app is just like high security clearance level type stuff. I mean, I have my whole brain is on there. Grocery lists, like new restaurants that I want to try out. Directions on how to fix my stove. The emotional text message that I never sent, but I redrafted 25 times. Like all of that is in my notes app. And I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate to that. A lot of people speculate that a famous TikToker and influencer by the name of Kathy Vu, they speculate that she, like us, had a very colorful notes app. So she mainly did voiceover TikToks. I actually came across her page before I even knew about this case, before this case even took place. I felt like we had very similar aesthetics. Like she loved everything pink, pastel. She had this moving out series that was actually very fun to watch. And I think that's how her social media just started blowing up, like taking off. She had this very sweet way of speaking. When I navigated dating before I met my boyfriend, I literally used to think that I had to prove to the people that I dated that I didn't need much from them. And it just kind of made you feel like, huh, she feels like an older sister or she feels like a sister telling me about her day. She's also a little bit inspirational. She would showcase her lifestyle, which was, I wouldn't even say it's like normal. It's just really nice. Like she had a very nice lifestyle. She had just moved into this new luxury apartment, bought a ton of these like cute kitchen wares and she would show everyone hacks on like how to do your laundry the right way, like what to check before you move into a new place. She also gave a lot of uh, relationship advice. She would post motivational workout videos. I mean, it wouldn't be hard to imagine that she had a lot of young girls looking up to this seemingly perfect life online. So in one TikTok, she talked about her relationship and all the things that her boyfriend would do for her. It's kind of giving the audience the whole, this is what a man should do in a relationship. This is how you should be cared for. If he wanted to, he would type of advice video. She writes text in the TikTok while she shows off clips of him doing all these things for her. And it says, things my boyfriend does that have forever raised my standards always carries my luggage for me, always down to travel and do something spontaneous, shows me his favorite things and is open to my interest, even if they're out of his comfort zone, is the most practical and thoughtful gift giver and pays attention to my interests. But most importantly, he caters to my emotional needs, which allows me to be my most authentic, weird self. She even posted a TikTok showcasing a MacBook that he had bought her for her birthday. And people were looking up to this relationship. I mean, they were commenting about how this is how boyfriends should be treating their girlfriends. This is the new standard. And then everything absolutely imploded. Kathy's boyfriend was wanted by Interpol for a double homicide. And Kathy Vu herself was arrested for tampering with a crime scene. Authorities would find a notes app on her phone filled with a list of cleaning supplies that they think was used in cleaning up the crime scene to a murder. A murder that allegedly, the authorities theorize, her boyfriend had committed. They also believe that her boyfriend bought her that MacBook very soon after. Social media has now stated that was her thank you for cleaning up the crime scene gift. Let's get into what happened. As always, full show notes are available at RottenMingoPodcast.com. This is still a developing case, and this is just what we know as of the production date, or rather, like, what we know of when this video is posted. With the trial coming up, I'm assuming there's going to be a lot more information that comes out with the legal process. I will say, though, okay, nobody has been convicted of a crime. People have been charged. There are theories of why they've done things. There are speculations. But this is just all theories at the end of the day. We're not going to know if they're guilty until it's proved in court. Wait, so the boyfriend and 
Kathy are both arrested or、um, bailed, or so basically, the boyfriend has another accomplice that、uh-huh. was arrested for capital murder. So the boyfriend and the accomplice, another guy, are arrested for capital murder. They have not been granted bail, and Kathy has been granted bail, and she has much, much, much lesser charges of tampering with evidence, I believe. I will say though that this case, even on the social media, but also the mainstream aspect, like the mainstream media front of this, has centered more around Kathy Vu. She's become the main topic of discussion with this case because I think you know, for one, it's fascinating that someone can have such a quote open or transparent public internet life, if you will, and then turn around and have such dark things happening behind the scenes. I do understand the fascination of that, and even just the contrast itself of her being. This very soft voice girl with like a love for San Rio, and then allegedly being involved in a brutal, gruesome double homicide. You know, I can understand、yeah. that there's a lot of shock and intrigue, but it is important to remember that there are two other parties involved, and I think because there's just not a lot of information on them, everyone has just been laser focused on Kathy Vu. And I will say that even this episode will have more information on Kathy as of right now, since she was the public figure when all of this went down. But hopefully that will change as the trial moves forward, and we will get more information on the two other perpetrators. But with that being said, let's get into it. In 2009, a reporter slash writer named Evan Radcliffe disappeared. 2009. Okay, well he tried to disappear. It was a challenge. He wanted to see, in the era of Facebook, Instagram, cell phones, security cameras on every street corner, he wanted to see if he could hide somewhere in the world without his readers finding him. He offered up five thousand dollars for anyone that could find him, and they had one month to do so. There, this was like a whole movement on social media. People were forming groups, like watchdog groups. They were forming Instagram pages. It was everyone was trying to find him. Not even just for the five thousand dollars, but for the fact that they could.、Mm. They wanted to prove something. He was found three weeks later by a team of civilians, civilians who were interested in the reward money. Three weeks. So, did he post anything on social media during、he、that time? He left. Yes, he left little nuggets here and there,、uh, but not. They weren't big. They were really not big at all. Yeah, you know the TikTok that try to find where I am with、yes. the with the photo, like you locate a geo locate. Oh, so scary, terrifying,、yeah. right? And I imagine it's only getting harder now because that was in two thousand and nine, and this is twenty twenty three. I mean, think about what could have happened in like the past fourteen years. Yes, fourteen years. But if you had to, right? Do you think it would be safer to go to a densely populated city? Like, would you rather go to New York City, Hong Kong, Macau, Beijing, like all these cities where there's so many people that you can get lost in the crowd that you can blend in, or do you go somewhere where very few travel, like the middle of nowhere? Yeah, for sure. Middle of nowhere. Yeah. Less eyeballs, like somewhere wooded, somewhere quiet. Yeah, absolutely. Interesting. So Ho Chi Minh City actually has more people than New York City. Did you know that?、Oh, really? Yeah.、Oh. The city surrounds the Saigon River. It, it's in Vietnam, which I heard it's really beautiful at night because the city lights reflect off the river. Yeah, and it's beautiful. It's a city that also feels like it never sleeps. Apparently, their nightlife is really crazy. Like just rooftop bars, nightclubs, casinos. Like no sleep. Next club, back to back, and it just feels like. A big Vegas, but better. Like you can blend in, you can feel like you can let loose, and no one will know. No one will even remember by the time that the sun comes up. Even in February, it feels like summertime in Vietnam. So thousands of people they're traveling from all over the world to Vietnam to hide away from like the winter months of the other countries. And it's nice in the sense that everyone truly feels like they go about their business. They don't really pay too much attention to what everybody else in the city is doing. I imagine that finding your friend in a city like this would require back and forth communication. Like you would need to have a meet up spot. You would need to coordinate a time. But imagine you have to find someone in the city that doesn't want to be found, someone that's hiding. There were two young men hiding in Vietnam. They're trying their best to blend in and be, be invisible. You have twenty-six year old Polly Fan and twenty-five year old Jaden Wen. The two took very different approaches. They landed in Vietnam on different planes on different days, and Poli he tried his best to blend in with the crowd in Ho Chi Minh City. 
he's trying to stay under the radar. He's trying to appear normal from the outside. Like if you were to bump into him on the street, you're like, oh, this is just another random resident. He would actually go to the gym. Sometimes he would even go out on the weekends. He would join the nightlife. And every time he would go back to his place of residence, he would look left, he would look right, he would look over his shoulder to make sure that he wasn't being followed. And then he would put his key in the door. Jaden had a completely different approach. He went to like the suburb suburbs, the place where very few go, not even just like regular suburbs, I'm talking like countryside. He met a young woman, pretended to fall in love, offered her a visa into his home country, the United States, and her parents willingly took him in with open arms. And for a while it worked. Nobody suspected that these two young men were wanted by Interpol. Nobody knew that. Because just a few days ago, before they landed in Vietnam, they had allegedly, brutally murdered two men in cold blood. Let me take you to the day of the murder. January 26th, 2023. Let's talk about John, okay? John is his fake name. He's anonymous, but he is a neighbor. He's been trying to fall asleep for the past... I don't know, like three hours, he's tossing and turning. He's trying to put his cushion over his head and his damn dog just was going at it, like barking nonstop, just would not give it up. John is like, what do I need to do? Do I need to show you every room in the house to tell you that we don't have a home intruder? Nothing is going on. His dog is practically pacing around his house nonstop as if someone had lit a fire under its butt. Side note, John doesn't really seem that nervous that there was something going on or that there was someone outside lurking in the woods trying to get into his house. He lived in a gated private community in Houston, Texas with only about like 10 other houses. It's really safe. The houses were also pretty close to one another. So it's not townhomes. They're not stuck together. They're not sharing walls, but they've got tiny little slivers of side yards. So it's really hard for someone to have a home invasion and the neighbors don't notice. Everyone sees everything. So this is pretty much as safe as you can get in a single family home. There's a lot of ring cameras nearby, a lot of nosy residents, a lot of close proximity. It would be very difficult for someone to even rob one of these 10 houses. So he lifts up his head and he's like, okay, what in the world is going on? Like, please go to sleep. And he flips over and he knocks out. He gets up a few hours later to start the day. And he looks at his window as he always does as he drinks his cup of coffee and everything is normal. Neighbors are walking their dogs as normal. He could see across the street into his neighbor's house, James. James is his neighbor. And James's white Prius is in the garage. I mean, everything seems like that morning bustle before everyone's heading to work. John picks up his dog to bring him to the front lawn and he glances back up at James's house. And it's strange because his white Prius is sitting in his garage. His garage door is open. It's lifted. Hmm, like he forgot to close it. Yes, but now that he's outside, he can actually hear the Prius is running. The engine is on. Hmm. And it's parked, and it doesn't look like anyone was inside of the car. But again, would you really consider this some sort of like bombshell neighborly gossip even? It's January in Houston. I mean, it's, it's not freezing, but it's pretty cold. If you're running into your house to grab your phone or run back out to leave after you grab something, you would probably keep your car on so that you don't get cold on the way out. So John goes back into his home and he goes through the motions of his morning routine. He heads back outside once more to hop into his car and leave when he's like, oh my God, James's Prius is still parked in the garage. The garage is still open and the car is still on and there's no sign of James anywhere. And again, he doesn't think anything terrible happened. He's just thinking maybe he doesn't know. I got to let him know like, hey, bud, you left your car open, right? You left your car on. He called James's phone. No response. He starts feeling a little curious, a little anxious. So he makes his way over to his neighbor's garage. And the engine is on. But not only that, this is where he starts feeling kind of like an unsettling feeling. The windshield wipers are going. Was it rainy last night? Maybe. It's really weird. Why are the windshield wipers still going? Like, even if you're running in to grab something, you would probably turn it off. Windshield wipers, even when it's drizzling, I like to turn it off and then I'm like, okay, I need it again. It's just, yeah, it's just like, tick, 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 it's squeaking like sk, 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 yeah. back and forth, back and forth, almost in like a creepy haunted manner. The car is empty. The garage is empty. The house feels eerily quiet. And you're just like, James, no response. John walks around, goes to the front door because it's, it's, 
pretty rude to like open the garage door and be like, hello, are you in here? And he starts knocking on the door, ringing the doorbell, no response. And now John's thinking either I move on with my day and I go to work or I do something a little bit crazy. And you know what? It's crazy, but I think it's okay. He goes around the bushes and starts trying to peek in through the front window of the house. If James catches him, I'm sure that there would be this awkward moment of explanation, but something in his gut is like, I got to do it. I just don't feel good about this. I don't think that I can go about the rest of my day and not keep thinking back on this morning. John tries his best to balance and get as close to the window as he can, and his stomach drops. I mean, the heavy gut feeling that he had was confirmed. The house was totally ransacked. Just things were thrown about everywhere and there were some splatters on various surfaces that were very dark. And yes, it looked like blood. Like it didn't look like someone was spilling water. It didn't look like a water balloon burst. It was blood. John runs back to his house. He calls 911 and within minutes at around 8.30 a.m., officers arrive at the house for a welfare check. I think officers were expecting to walk into a potential home invasion or some sort of burglary, maybe a domestic issue, but I don't think that they were prepared to come across a scene that looked that looked like it was out of a scene of Breaking Bad. They walk into the house, furniture turned over, thrown everywhere, doors, cabinets, all swung open, blood splattered on the walls, floors, bullet fragments throughout the house. And in the middle of the chaos, there was a man laying in a large pool of blood. He had been clearly shot multiple times. To get a better idea of who this was and how they were killed, authorities searched the rest of the house and found several packages of marijuana packed in airtight wrappings, 129 pounds of marijuana. 129 pounds? That's like a human. That's like, yeah. So in in Texas, marijuana is not legal. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that would be, um, that would probably possession with intent to distribute Okay, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So they also found 10 pounds of hash oil. So think of like a a dog, like the weight of a dog in hash oil. What is hash oil? It's like a CBD oil that is like more potent than marijuana. Okay. And when they opened up the freezer, the freezer, they found $36,000 in cash staring back at them. But nobody took this? No. I mean, the marijuana itself is worth a lot of money, but then $39,000 just in cash? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know why. And you say all the cabinets were open. Yeah, so it seems like someone was trying to find money or find drugs Mm. or find something. But what happened? Like, how did they not take any of this? And why is there someone dead? Yeah. Because this just doesn't make sense. Like, what the hell happened here? Was this a drug-related murder? If so, why did they not take anything? Why didn't they take the marijuana? Why didn't they take the frozen cash? Authorities, they quickly pieced together that the dead man in the living room was not James. He was not the homeowner. What? So who is he? How is he connected to all of this? The man in the house was 35-year-old Dana Rizdal. He was actually from Oregon, but James was a very close friend of his that he was visiting in Houston. Okay. So James had actually lived in Oregon prior to all of this. And this is kind of pertinent because both of them were in the marijuana business and it's completely legal in Oregon. Mm. So they were legal distributors of marijuana. And then James decided to kind of take a step back from this business. He stopped working with all of his companies in Oregon. He moved to Houston to focus on being a father. And his best friend Dana was visiting him. Now, it does seem like maybe he hadn't cut all of the ties because, like I said, there were 129 pounds of marijuana in his home. And I don't want to see people victim blaming because it doesn't really matter if you have possession of drugs, if you're murdered, like, that means nothing. Like, you can't be like, oh, well, they had drugs. It's a very weird way of thinking. So it seems like they hadn't fully cut the ties. Now, the problem is marijuana is illegal in Texas. Mm -hmm. Dana seemed to be visiting his close friend in Houston. And people said that the two were just like as thick as thieves. They had very similar energies. They had these larger than life personalities. They were also the type of friends that very much valued loyalty. What does it mean as thick as thieves? It's a saying. It's a saying, yeah, where they're just the type, like, when you're friends with them, you know they have your back. Mm -hmm. And they're just really best buds. They would never betray each other. There's no way that anyone could come between them. Like, thick as thieves, you know? And it sounds cheesy. And in today's case, loyalty might not seem like 
such a positive thing anymore. You're going to see why. But these two, they were very loyal and they were very honest with one another. Like, you know, those friends that will stick by you no matter what. But if you do something, they'll be like, hey, that was dumb. Why did you do that? That was kind of their friendship. So why was James's close friend, Dana, who was presumably there to meet and visit James, why was he found dead in his house? And where was James? Police had a few leads to follow, one being Dana's car. Neighbors reported seeing a Dodge Ram with Oregon license plates. It's like a pickup truck parked in front of James's house. And now it's missing. Clearly, Dana wasn't the one to drive it off the property. So who did? It seems like whoever the killer was stole Dana's car afterwards as like a getaway vehicle of sorts. So this car could potentially provide them for the answers that they're looking for. They issue out a be on the lookout, a bolo for the 2002 white Dodge Ram. Additionally, authorities reported James missing. They tow the Toyota Prius. So the Toyota Prius is James's car. It's in the garage. They tow it to their impound lot. This is like police evidence lot. This is not just like a random tow truck lot. This is police evidence. This is where they're going to take your car if they confiscate it. And they go back to following the rest of the leads. Dana's pickup truck was found two days later, abandoned. Just the truck was completely empty. James was nowhere in sight. They towed Dana's truck to the police station to be processed, processed for possible evidence as well. And other officers that are working on this case, they used Find My iPhone to track down James's phone. It was just left at the White Oak Bayou. So it looked like either someone discarded it to get rid of evidence, or maybe James himself could have thrown it out the window or thrown it away himself to avoid being tracked and throw officers off his trail. So now, authorities have Dana's body, Dana's car, James's car, James's phone, but where is James? Now, this is the part that I cannot wrap my head around. This is truly bizarre. Five days later, investigators find James's body in the Toyota Prius. What? In the trunk of the Toyota Prius that they have t- that ha- that they had confiscated and impounded to the police lot five days ago. I don't know You're why. Kidding and me. it's not like he was hidden somehow in this very intricate manner in the Toyota Prius. He was in the trunk of the Prius. Wow. There's I even am- a very eerie picture of a police officer with crime scene tape all over James's home, and you see the Toyota Prius still parked in the garage, and the officer is kind of like looking at it. At that moment, James's body was in the trunk. What? Yeah. I, I just... Well. So I guess they just started processing the Prius for evidence and popped open the trunk. So that's on February 1st of 2023. They found James Martin's body. I mean, it's just so confusing to me. Nobody knew why. Nobody knew why they didn't search the car earlier because they. it seemed like they had multiple officers working this case. Clearly, I saw some arguments that said that they weren't able to get a warrant until five days later, but I highly what? doubt that. Like you're talking about a very gruesome murder. I think the judge would have prioritized the warrant to a degree. And they also, they had so much probable cause to get a search warrant, like stat. ASAP. Wait, there's a murder and you need a warrant to search the crime scene? Yeah, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. And peop- okay, please, someone who's more familiar with the legalities of this, but if they're already searching the home... Yeah, and, and the they car- impounded a car. They took the car. Yes, if you yeah. have the authority to move private property, like a car, from one location to another, I feel like you could search the car. I mean, also, if you they're don't already need to search the car, you're already in the car. Just pop they're the trunk. They're already driving the car or take. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, do, uh, I just don't yeah. understand. Wow. OK, and another thing is, if they're already searching the home and the car is technically on property, yeah. would it not be a part of the search warrant? And I also believe it is much, much easier for police to search your car versus your home. Like the amount of um, probable cause that they would need yeah. to search your car is like here. Maybe they went in the car and they're like, oh, it seems totally normal. There's no blood. There's nothing. So we should be fine. Wow. It's just a very strange detail to this case. I hope it's explained later during the trial because I just don't, I personally don't understand it. If you have more insight, please let me know in the comments. I tried looking more into it, but I'm like, none of this makes sense. Everyone seems confused. So back to the case. James was found beaten, tied up, and dead in the trunk of his car. His feet, ankles, and hands were bound with duct tape. There was also duct tape wrapped around his head and face. It was also clear that he too died from multiple gunshot wounds, just like his friend Dana. 
So police now, now they have a double homicide on their hands. And honestly, it's a very weird situation. They have a little bit to go off of, but it's not a lot. The sheer amount of marijuana found in the house, along with the money in the freezer, it gives them potential insight on the type of crime that it could be, on the type of people that might be involved, but it doesn't really answer who exactly is still involved. They had no eyewitnesses to go off of. None of the other neighbors saw anything. Yeah, sure, John was like, my dog was barking up a storm that night, but he didn't see anything. He didn't hear anything. All James's neighbor said was, we saw that pickup truck, the Dodge Ram, Dana's car, and then it was gone. That's it. We didn't see any people go in and out of the house. We didn't see someone drive off in that car. We don't know. So the police, they went to their favorite eyewitness security cameras. They canvassed the area to see if anyone had ring cameras, home security cameras, businesses with security systems, and eventually they found videos from different cameras, different angles, and they were able to piece together somewhat of a timeline. Eventually, these little videos, like little breadcrumbs, like, you know, the tape on the forest, like when you leave little breadcrumbs, it's like that. It would lead them straight to the suspect's door. And I think... You know, with a case like this, I'm sure the police don't have a suspect image in their minds, or at least they shouldn't if they're good at their jobs. Like you shouldn't have a preconceived notion of who the suspect is, right? But with everything they were presented with thus far, the evidence, the breadcrumbs, the clues, I imagine that they had a vague idea of the type of person that they were looking for. You're like, okay, maybe you could see them and be like, I could see how these two are connected. Maybe the suspect has some drug charges in the past, or maybe this person has some sort of criminal history, maybe some dealing charges. I could see that, right? But they ended up at the door of a Sanrio-loving, pastel-obsessed TikToker slash influencer, Kathy Vu. And they're like, what the hell is going on right now? For example, Kathy posted a TikTok where she gave dating advice and she said, it's okay to be independent, but don't make it the main reason why someone should date you. She talks about how before she met her current boyfriend, she used to feel like she had to prove to all these boys that she was independent and that she made her own money. And she felt like it was, it was a good thing to show men that she didn't need them. But instead she said she realized she was only attracting bums. That's what she said, bums with that kind of attitude, basically saying, as a woman, you should be taken care of. This is paraphrasing, but she said she never really received flowers from anyone before she started dating her boyfriend because she just, she just wanted to show men how chill and indifferent and laid back she was. She wanted to make herself digestible. And she advises young girls that they should take up space, that they should be as irritating as you want to be. Like, don't change your personality for men. Like, don't do these things for men. She said that now she doesn't want to go through relationships dumbing herself down to make herself convenient for others, mainly men. The only men that you attract by proving that you don't need much are bums. They foam at the mouth when they find out that you don't need much from them to be happy. The only person I was hurting by not requiring much from my partner is myself. Bum ass men love women that are really independent because most of the time this hyper independence comes from some type of trauma. Now we don't know too much about Kathy Vu's relationship other than what she puts out there, which is it's pretty clear that she's very selective in what information she puts online about her boyfriend. There are parts of their relationship that now in hindsight, people have been picking apart. Yes, there are, okay? So Kathy stated that her boyfriend was shy. And that's why she never really showed his face on camera. I don't even think people knew his name. Her boyfriend's name is Polly Fan. And in hindsight, netizens now believe that she never shared his face because he was heavily involved in illegal activities. But it does seem like he showered her with monetary gifts. He would take her on trips, buy her designer stuff. But Kathy still prided herself in having this very successful career. So yeah, from the outside, they seem like a very perfect couple. Well, now video evidence showed two men presumed to be Polly and Polly's good friend, Jaden, arriving at Kathy Vu's apartment complex. When did they arrive at Kathy's? The day before the murder, like the night of the murder. Also, they they met up there first before they... 
Okay. The police are trying to reverse track the movements. All they know is that Dana is dead and James was found dead in his white Prius that was parked in his garage. So they're trying to see when did the Prius pull up to the garage? Where was the Prius coming from? Who was driving the Prius? So they get all these little CCTV clips. And the last time that James was seen alive was entering Kathy Vu's apartment, or at least mm. the apartment building. But on the CCTV cameras, they don't see Kathy Vu. They see Kathy Vu's boyfriend and their friend, Jaden Wen. Mm -hmm. So you've got Polly and Jaden meeting up with James at Kathy Vu's apartment building. Mm. So we never saw James driving home. No. They actually see other people driving home. Mm, so the white Prius was driven by someone else. Yeah. So the white okay. Prius is driven by James into Kathy Vu's apartment building. So James is alive at this point and he's driving his car and he's meeting up with Polly and Jaden. Yes. That's what it seems like, right? Because what they're, they're kind of guiding him into the garage, motioning him for, to park in the garage. Now, this is where I have questions. All reports indicate that this was a regular schmegular apartment building garage, meaning like a parking lot. Maybe there's a gate. Maybe you need like a beeper to get in or some sort of like tag to get into the garage. But it's pretty public, like the rest of the residents can use it. Maybe guests of the residents can use it. I don't know how all of the next series of events plays out if this is just a regular schmegular parking lot. Mm. Because soon someone's going to transport James's body into the trunk of his car. Yes. How was that done, right? We don't know yet. And I'm okay. sure maybe they're saving that for the trial. Some people have speculated online that there are certain apartment complexes that have private garages for residents to lease. So it's like a home garage. It's weird. It's like a home garage. It's closed off. It doubles as like a storage unit. But I couldn't tell if Kathy Vu's apartment offered that type of service or even had that. So all we know is that James is seen driving up in his Toyota Prius. He meets up with Polly Fan, Kathy Vu's boyfriend, and their friend, Jaden Wen. This is the last time that James is seen alive. The last time he's seen is walking into the apartment with the two men. There is no movement. And then nothing happens. There is no movement, no significant happenings on camera. And half an hour later, you can see the garage doors to the apartment complex open and the CCTV cameras show two men backing out of the garage in James's Prius. James is nowhere to be seen. And the police track the Prius all the way back to James's home. So it seems like James is, the theory is, James was murdered inside this apartment. He was put into the trunk of his car and then his car was driven back to his house. The two men are suspected of being inside James's house. And within that hour, Dana arrives in his Dodge Ram. And a little while after that, Dana's Dodge is seen driving away from the house. And once again, there's two men in that Dodge. So from the footage, it's easy for authorities to piece together a theory of what they believe took place. And again, this is just a theory. No one has been convicted. Authorities believe that James was lured to the apartment complex where Kathy Vu lives by Kathy's boyfriend and their friend Jaden. He met up with the two men. There are some rumors that Kathy helped lure James to the apartment, but I don't see any proof of that. James was most likely ambushed, tied up, and murdered in the apartment. Authorities felt that it was clearly premeditated. And just going by the officer's theory moving forward, they believe that the suspects, Polly, Jaden, right? They placed James in the trunk of his own car. They drive to James's own house where they parked the car in the garage, kept the car running for whatever reason. I'm not sure entirely why. Maybe they were in a rush. Maybe it was just the chaos of the situation. But it is a strange detail. Authorities believe now they went inside to ransack the place looking for drugs, money, and or both. But while they're in that process, Dana comes home, sees what they're doing. And officers theorize that Dana was killed to avoid any eyewitnesses to this crime. And since they had just escalated from a homicide to a double homicide and the idea that perhaps, you know, the murder of James was premeditated to agree, they might have felt like now this is getting out of control. Like we had planned to kill James. We had planned to do this. But now, now this is like a shit show. This is a mess. Maybe there was even a struggle that broke out. This is the theory, right? Authorities believe it was a spur of the moment decision to kill Dana. Maybe they were so shaken up that they fled right away without taking any of the drugs or money. Or maybe they believe that the gunshots could be heard by the neighbors. 
they drive away in Dana's car because they can't take James's car. James is in the trunk of that car. They drive away in Dana's car, abandon it on the side of the road, and then they run on foot is the theory, is the allegation. I mean, the movement kind of makes sense. If this theory does come to be true, it's it's genuinely terrifying that two people's lives were taken so so abruptly and brutally for some drugs and money. Like, I get it, it's a lot of drugs. I get it, it's a lot of money. But like, where's the humanity? Like, these are people. Now, I know a big argument of this case is gonna be, why were there drugs in James's house in the first place? And like I said, James and Dana were said to be commercial marijuana farmers from Southern Oregon, where it is very much legal and they were licensed. But more recently, James had moved back to Houston just to be closer with his family. And it seemed clear that both of these men wanted to distance themselves from this line of work. They were kind of pulling away from the industry. James, he wanted to focus on being a good dad for his son. Meanwhile, Dana, he started kind of hanging out more in Portland. He wasn't a father yet, but he had a nephew and niece in Colorado and in Washington. He would take time out of his busy schedule, travel across state lines, just to spend like a day or two with his niece and nephew. It's like he would, people said he came alive whenever he saw his family. You could just see how proud he was to be a part of their lives and just to watch them grow, which is a pretty big sacrifice for Dana. Dana was Dana was big with work. It really was his passion before he started kind of pulling away. So in 2016, he started a cannabis distribution company called LTMRN. It was pretty successful. A lot of people said that Dana just had this crazy networking ability. Like if you had an aerial view of a networking event, people would all kind of like ebb and flow around, but there was always a circle just gravitating towards Dana. People really liked him. He was hilarious. He was a good natured man. And people could see that within just like five minutes of meeting with him. It was so easy to talk to him. He had all this life experience and a lot of stories that he would share with people. And it was just so fun. He would be out one day partying in Vegas. And then the next day he's hiking through Yosemite. I mean, this was a man that loved to experience life and just go on these new adventures and just really challenge himself to see what else is out there. It was something that he had in common with James. A friend of James said, you could see this man in a meeting with Fortune 500 CEOs. He would fit right in. He would be comfortable in his own skin. And then that night he would fit right in at like a crazy rock concert. He also loved rapping. He self-produced a fun rap song called Hustle Hustle Ball. (laughs) And like some of his friends kind of poked fun at him because he's shirtless and he's got sunglasses and a backward cap on in the video and he's like rapping. It's posted on YouTube. And they thought it was very, very silly. But it's also just what made him so lovable. He was very free-spirited. He didn't care. He never took himself or anything that seriously. He just did what he liked. He just did what made him happy. He also founded a Portland-based edibles company in 2016. And in the end, by 2023, both of these men were starting to pull away from the cannabis industry in Oregon. James, he wanted to do it for his family. Dana, he wanted to try experimenting with different businesses. But I don't think that, you know, it's... It's something that you can just wake up and wash your hands of. Just be done with the industry. Maybe they had a lot of inventory left over. Maybe it was, you know, something else. It was a business that they had built for years. So most likely, it seems that a few ties had remained. Now the problem is marijuana is not yet legal in Texas. So police... They execute a search warrant on Kathy Vu's apartment. Now, if I'm not mistaken, this is the same apartment that she did the whole series of moving into my new apartment on. Like the one that kickstarted her career on TikTok. And everything had been so wholesome online. And it is now believed that this very apartment is allegedly where a murder took place. So it's, it's kind of jarring. I do want to clarify that Kathy was never seen on CCTV cameras luring James into the garage. And that's not to say that she's not involved in some way, shape or form, but authorities clearly believe that she was. Do we know if she was home inside or no? Um, it doesn't seem like it from what I can gather, but we haven't received like a firm statement, at least that myself and my researchers mm. haven't been able to find where it was like she was not home. Okay. It's kind of like all these different things lead us to believe that she wasn't home at the time. Okay. And I'm sure if she was home, it would be shown on CCTV that at one point she arrived home earlier of the day. Yeah. That would put her at the crime scene, which will 
change her charges. Yes, yes. For this case. It, right? Yeah, she'd probably be an accomplice to capital murder. Right. So, okay. Got yeah. It. So authorities clearly believe that she was involved in some way, shape, or form. They found an HEB store receipt. So this is like your Ralph's or your Kroger. They found a receipt that showed that Kathy purchased items the day of the murder. And, um, you know, the items were, they were suspicious. She bought bleach, peroxide, trash bags. On top of that, police found bleach and iodine bottles in the, the back Ble of Kathy's I'm sorry, car. Bleach and what? Iodine. What's it's iodine? like salt, basically. It's like a cleaner. You can use oh. it as cleaning. Found in the back of Kathy's car. And um, yeah, to buy that on the day of the murder is is it's kind of suspicious when someone is seen coming into your apartment and then never seen coming out and then you buy cleaning supplies before the murder took place. Oh, this was before. before. Not oh, after, not during, but it was before James was last seen alive. But to be fair, I mean, you could argue that maybe she was just a clean freak. I mean, there was a TikTok that she posted that stated that she loved cleaning. She was insinuating that she was kind of a bit of a clean freak. I will play it for the visual watchers, but for the audio listeners, she's kind of doing a day in my life as a corporate marketing girl in the alcohol industry. She walks us through her day of getting ready for this promotional event at a club. She's got to go to Michael's, get some gift bags, set up a backdrop, photo booth. It shows her being an incredibly hardworking, but the part that has definitely been picked apart like to Helen back is at the club during her day in my life TikTok there is a moment where she talks about how this particular club has a wet rag scent because a lot of the workers use wet wet rags to clean the countertops and she talks about how she even brought her own cleaning supplies and is literally seen in the TikTok cleaning the counters while people around her are partying okay so heart the club that we were at sometimes has this like musty smell because of the wet rags they use. They're not entirely clean, so there's always this really bad lingering smell. My friends thought it would be funny to record me cleaning. I actually didn't know they were recording at first, but I did bring my cleaner bottle from home to wipe down my section. So people picked it apart because she was cleaning? Um, some people stated that she posted this because she wanted to kind of have something to fall back on. Like, you know, when you're in that state of like, I'm about to, this is purely speculation from netizens, not even police, okay? Some netizens were saying maybe she posted it because she knows she's about to buy cleaning products for a murder. And now she's like slipping that in there to be like, look, I actually love cleaning. I'm just a clean freak. And that has nothing to do with anything. It's not out of the norm for me. Some people were saying it's just a coincidence. So this TikTok would be dragged to the depths of hell and back and analyzed till it could no longer be analyzed. And some people argue that she truly maybe was just a clean freak. And while most of us probably don't buy bleach, iodine, peroxide, trash bags all at once and coincidentally on the day of the murder that allegedly took place in your own home, but maybe she's a clean freak. Like we won't know until there is a trial. Authorities stated that they found a note on her phone, which was a list of items to purchase, including, but not limited to, bleach, towels, and iodine. Is iodine a very common cleaning supply? Or? I don't think so. Because I mm. feel like I would kind of consider myself a bit of a clean freak. And I, I don't even use bleach. When's the last time you saw bleach in our house? Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, you know, you can use a little bit. Yeah. I mean, not saying that everyone with bleach in their house. I know that there's a lot of uses for bleach, but... I guess mm -hmm. it's just a very hard substance I try to stray away from mm -hmm. as like a just a cleaning my apartment type of girly. They also believe that this indicates that Kathy had prior knowledge of what was about to happen and she was planning to help assist and have somewhat an somewhat of an active role in the crime. They also ran her phone records and they found that Kathy was messaging her boyfriend, Polly, during and after the suspected time of the murders. Authorities think that she was coordinating using her garage and apartment and then coordinating the cleanup. So just to clarify, it seems like officers believe that she was helping coordinate and clean up the crime scene. So we don't know what she said. No. This is from police. Police saying we feel like this is what was going on. Yeah, I'm sure police know kind of what was said. Maybe maybe the text messages, maybe not the phone mm -hmm. calls, right? Like there were multiple FaceTime calls. Um, there were some speculations that she was calling to verify over and over again that her boyfriend had closed the garage when they left her apartment. 
that's kind of what we know as of right now. After Polly and Jaden left her apartment in James's car, she FaceTimed him six times in the span of 25 minutes. They also texted each other to verify that the garage door had been closed. Hmm. So she at least know that they are left. there. They're there and they left. But you could argue that she didn't know that James was there. Right. You could argue that she only thought that her boyfriend was there and was like, hey, babe, did you close the garage door? Because I'm not home. Multiple times or? It's It says that the, she called him six times mm. or she was FaceTiming with him six times in the span of 25 minutes. Mm. So I think... I think more than the cleaning supplies, the text messages and the phone calls are probably a worse look, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, the cleaning supplies, you could try and twist it and argue and be like, you know, she works in a corporate sphere. She Maybe she bought it for this or that. But the text messages are interesting. Now, I have seen some online discourse, and right now it's all speculations and rumors, this whole case is, but some people have posted online that Kathy was a very sweet, trusting, almost naive to a fault person that probably was too scared to say no to her boyfriend, which I'm not sure how to feel about that because she's 23, I believe. So when you're 23, maybe there's some things, I'm a people placer, I have such a hard time saying no to people, trust me, I understand that feeling, I relate to it, like, on a spiritual, deep level, but if you ask me to clean up a crime scene, that's a solid no, so I don't know where that argument comes in, some people say that she didn't really know what she was getting into, and maybe thought that because her boyfriend was potentially, allegedly involved in some harsh, illegal activities, she was scared for her own life, she got roped into it, because she was terrified and then i see the argument that people are saying no she's 23 she was actually benefiting from her boyfriend's alleged illegal work she was constantly she wasn't afraid to spend his money going on trips getting all these gifts she was benefiting in some way and now she's cleaning up a crime scene you can't really say that she was so scared and terrified so it's just kind of an argument i do think that it does rub a lot of people the wrong way that she was kind of preaching online about having a good relationship and having boyfriends that respect and cherish you meanwhile she is accused of doing something absolutely heinous for her boyfriend I also see a third group of people, a very small, tiny group of people that believe if the series of events are true, they like Kathy even more now. What? I actually saw a lot of Reddit comments that said, <laughs> gotta get me a ride or die like Kathy Vu. Oh, come on. Yeah, which is truly unhinged if you ask me. Yeah, this is not a movie. This is not nothing to <laughs> romanticize here. Kathy Vu was taken into custody and she started giving her version of events. She claimed the night of the murders, she had a work-related dinner planned and she actually wanted to invite her boyfriend, Polly, to go with her. He didn't show up. Instead, he messaged her saying, hey, babe, sorry, I can't go. Like, emergency happened. So he couldn't be there. She stated that that's all she knew. She didn't know what the emergency was. She didn't know emergency was murder. He just couldn't show up to her work event. That's all he said. Now, I'm not sure if she did this as a self-preservation argument or if she was still looking out for her boyfriend, Polly, but she told officers that James, the victim in the trunk, was the problem. She stated that he had a history of threatening people, including her own boyfriend, and she said, quote, if anything were to have happened, it would definitely have been self-defense. That's what she told the police. Yes, after being arrested. She told officers that James owed her boyfriend, Polly, about $40,000. And when asked why, she said, after a narcotics-related transaction that didn't go as planned. Which authorities didn't believe. Because according to James's mom, Polly was the one who owed James money. So while officers state that they had knowledge of a history between the two, it seems like they are inclined to believe that Polly was actually the one that owed James money. And maybe, theorizing, this is pure speculation, potentially, Polly had lured James out under the guise of like, I'm going to give you your money back. Mm. And instead of giving his money back, he murdered him so that he could be absolved of that debt and then went to his house to ransack it and steal stuff. And maybe it could even look like he was just targeted for the drugs. But the plan is really not... Smart. Yeah, so I yeah. just, I don't see how they think they can get away with this for even a day. Yeah. 
See, that's the weird part. I genuinely feel like if they found James's car in the trunk, this is my personal opinion. If they found James's body in the trunk sooner, potentially, they wouldn't have been at, looking at a fugitive situation. Because like, like they will catch them immediately before they flee to Vietnam. Right, right, right. Yeah. But even that, they still caught them very quickly. Yeah. So. So Tuesday, March 21st of 2023, Kathy Vu was officially charged with tampering in the deaths of James Martin and Dana Rizdal. She appeared in court with the most Texan looking lawyer I have ever seen in my life. Like I'm talking cowboy hat and everything. Yes. Mm. Her attorney focused on getting her out on bail. He tried to draw sympathy from the judge, stating that Kathy Vu had lost her job after her arrest, which I don't know why he said that. I don't know why certain attorneys say things like that, because it's kind of a situation of read the room, sir. Two people were killed. I don't think losing a job is the end of the world. And I don't think anyone is going to dig deep into their hearts right now to find sympathy for something like that. But her attorney continued to argue that Kathy had only been dating Polly for a few months and she, quote, only did what her boyfriend told her to do. That did not sit right with a lot of netizens because ultimately she's not a minor. She's a 23-year-old woman who works a corporate job. Who, wait, wait, I'm so sorry. Before you go move yes. forward, the lawyer says she only did what the boy boyfriend told her to do. Yeah. So is she? Are, are they admitting that she did something for the boyfriend it relating like to it. the case? Yes. And I think it, the speculation online right now is that she's working with the prosecutors and is going to get out on probably no time as long as she can testify. Mm. Is the speculation? We don't know. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just kind of a weird thing to argue when she's a 23-year-old woman who has a corporate job, who lives on her own, is very independent. Also, a lot of her brand identity was on being independent. And now it's like, no, 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 she's not independent at all. She was manipulated has no idea what she's doing. Not saying that she can't be manipulated, but it's just, it was a weird argument to make in court. Netizens and the prosecutor argued she messaged him before, during, and after the murders. She bought the cleaning supplies and allegedly cleaned up the crime scene. To make matters worse, she went right back to posting TikToks the very next day, talking highly about her boyfriend, about how he's a great gift giver. And now, Wait, yeah, we don't the know- The next day of the crime? Yes. Now, we don't know if maybe her, this is like a pre-filmed TikTok, but she does go back to posting TikToks after the murder, hmm. before she's arrested. About the boyfriend. Yes, and she showed off this new MacBook that he had gifted her, which, you know, a lot of people feel like it's her, thank you for cleaning up a crime scene gift. That's what a lot of people said online. One thing that's really sweet about my boyfriend is that he thinks that he's a bad gifter, so he always overcompensates his gifting and actually gets me really good things. He saw my raggedy ass eight-year-old MacBook and replaced it for me. This is my birthday present. I'm so grateful. Wow. Yeah. Like, wow. Even if this was pre-filmed, still, like, this event just happened in your house last night. So... I see the argument that either she's incredibly heartless and if this is all true, if the police theory is true and they're all found guilty, she's incredibly heartless. I do see the other argument of like she is trying to appear as everything is normal because maybe people would question if she suddenly stopped posting or if her content was suddenly a different a shift. She was no longer talking about that. She was talking about other things. I don't know. Either way, it's very unsettling, I think. Yeah. And it's not really even about the MacBook, you know? It's just the fact that people argue Kathy doesn't seem affected by anything. And that is just not normal behavior for someone who allegedly was forced into doing something they didn't want to do. Judge Lori Chambers ordered Kathy to wear a GPS ankle monitor while released on a $40,000 bond. She is not allowed to have any communication with Polly or Jaden. Like I said, a lot of netizens were very confused about how she got off so lightly, but it is speculated that she's most likely working with the prosecutors to testify against Polly and Jaden later. Because while Kathy was still in the U.S. to face the legal battle herself, Polly and Jaden were nowhere to be found. Side note, I do see a lot of discourse that this, this is a learning moment for a lot of people. There is this 
romanticiza- romanticization among certain couples, like the ride or die couples, the Bonnie and Clyde couples. And sometimes that adds this romantic main character element to committing, you know, literal crimes like drug dealing. But this is a good learning lesson that even if you think that your partner is your ride or die and you could really feel that in your heart and soul, you would do anything for this partner. They are the Clyde to your Bonnie or vice versa. It might just be one-sided. Yeah, the guy left. Yeah, because if this is all true, if Kathy did indeed clean up a crime scene for her boyfriend, her boyfriend left her in the U.S. to deal with the aftermath while he fled to Vietnam without her. And he used her apartment to do the crime, allegedly, allegedly. Like, they know what's coming. Yeah, this is not... This is not Bonnie or Clyde. This is Bonnie and the fugitive who doesn't care about Bonnie, if this is all true. So just be careful who you think is your ride or die, or just be careful if you think that you'll do anything for your partner. There is a chain of events, though, that gets triggered when Interpol sends out a red notice. The first step is any of the member countries of Interpol, there's 195 member countries, each country can request a red notice be sent. A red notice is essentially a global international bolo. Be on the lookout for this fugitive on the run. Interpol, international police, will check the request to make sure that that government, that country, is not hunting down a refugee, is not hunting down a whistleblower. And once approved, that red notice will be sent to authorities in 195 different countries, which it sounds like you still have places to hide, but not really. Almost every single country in the world is involved in Interpol and will receive a red notice on their desk. So do they know that they went to Vietnam or they yes. have... Oh, they knew. They used their passports. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so they just need to go to Vietnam. Exactly. Then each country will decide how to handle that red notice. Vietnam's Interpol received a notice. The United States were looking for two citizens involved in a double homicide. U.S. citizens, Polly Fan and Jaden Wen. Now, again, to clarify, they're both U.S. citizens, and I'm not sure if they're born citizens or have immigrated. So it's unclear if they have family in Vietnam. um, And even if they did, were they staying with family? Were the family helping? We don't know. But we do know that the two fled to Vietnam. They're on the run. And the police have no official leads. They don't know if they went to Vietnam and then went on the run crossing borders, not using their passports. Here's a very interesting detail. One of the two perpetrators actually applied for an emergency passport reissue in the U.S., like, immediately after the crime, and then fled to Vietnam. What does that mean? Why is that? So that, I think, goes again to bolster the theory that they thought that they could premeditate a murder against James, kill him, and get away with it. But once Dana came in and the whole thing flew out of control, now they're like, okay, shit has hit the fan. I need to leave the country. They apply for a emergency passport what? to leave the country. They don't have a passport? Maybe it was expired. Oh, uh, I see. So that just goes to show like the train of thought. They thought that they uh, were going to get away with James's murder. It seems. What you're saying Allegedly. is, I'm sorry. What you're saying is the emergency passport, meaning he wasn't planning on leaving. Yes. This is very last minute. It's like, let me get my passport like, renewed so I can leave right now. So in, they didn't plan that part. Exactly. In like 48 hours. So I think that's why a lot of people believe the police theory that they premeditated James's murder, thought that they were going to get away with it. It flew out of control when Dana walked in on them ransacking the house. But what if that murder also is not premeditated? Yeah. That's why they didn't get the passport. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting, right? Yeah. Now the two have fled and they're dealing with Kim Bryant. Kim Bryant is the unit manager of the fugitive apprehension team in the Harris County DA's office. She was tasked with locating Polly and Jaden. So when this case comes onto her desk, she moves it up to the top of the priority just based on the shocking nature of the crime. She was told a few times by superiors and other people that had been working this unit, they're like, okay, the suspects have fled to Vietnam. Most likely, you might be looking at years, a few years before you can get them into the U.S. again and formally charged for their crimes. Like it's hard to find them. Hard. It's Mm -hmm. hard. There's a legal process to extradite them. It's going to be messy. It's going to be a long time, but just truly to find them. I mean, it's not like they're the most wanted on FBI's list. It's not like we can pour all of our resources into this one case. It's going to be lengthy. But Kim said, it's not hard to be tracked in some way, shape or form. 
And right now, with the time of, and age of digital footprint and surveillance, it will thankfully and hopefully always get harder and harder for criminals to go on the run and not be identified. So this little cat and mouse game begins. And as of right now, it's not entirely clear how Polly and Jaden were caught. I think that this is going to come out during trial. So we don't know what tactics that the fugitive teams or potentially Interpol use to catch them. But there is a running theory on TikTok, only on TikTok, okay? That Vietnam, like most Asian countries, they've got a lot of ajumas. They've got a lot of moms, if you will, that love to gossip. So a lot of people think that there was a train of gossip or word of mouth that really was the nail in the coffin caught the suspects hmm. which would be fascinating so the locals kind of helped yeah the, the locals theory. were like did you hear did you hear hmm. apparently they're in vietnam and I, i'm sure that this was a huge case for vietnamese americans because think about it for korean americans it would be a huge case and then i'm sure that there would be a lot of korean american to korean discourse because there's connections you know we mm -hmm. have family in korea Mm -hmm. the, the conversations would keep going. So June of 2023, Poli, Fan, and Jaden were caught. Poli was found living in Ho Chi Minh City. Authorities stated that he seemed alert. He seemed aware of his surroundings, yes, but he still tried to live a normal life, which is shocking. It's crazy. He would go to the gym. He would go out at nights on the weekends. He was actually arrested at the gym. Like, how do you go to a gym while you're a fugitive on the run? He should be, like, hiding in the room, curtains closed. Yes. Wow. Never going outside. Yeah. As for Jaden, he was found in the countryside, allegedly living with a woman and her family after telling them that he was going to marry her and get her a green card into the U.S., which I don't know how he thought that one was going to play out because, sir, you're a fugitive. They were extradited back to Harris County July 19th and July 21st, respectively. They have both been charged with capital murder, meaning that death penalty is on the table. So typically when you're committing a crime and then you murder someone while you're committing a crime. So in the state of Texas, if you're robbing someone and you end up killing them, if you're having a drug deal and you end up killing them, if you're assaulting someone and you end up killing them, it's automatically capital murder which is worse than just murder. So just homicide, uh, first degree homicide, you're looking at life in prison. Capital murder, you c it could be death penalty. All signs point to the fact that they will be facing potential death penalty charges. Both Polly and Jaden have been refused bail. Jaden's attorney have stated that they may be able to indict my client, but they absolutely do not have enough to convict him. Which I understand that this is an ongoing case and that lawyers have a job to do, but I just feel like, again, not the best statement. It feels like, at least from a public perspective, they have video surveillance at the crime scene from two separate crime scenes heading from one to another. Then you fled to Vietnam. It just doesn't feel like it's not absolute. Mm -hmm. He's saying you have absolutely no evidence. I don't know if it's absolute. Maybe it's circumstantial. You could argue that, right? So right now, people are speculating that Kathy Vu will be throwing Polly and Jaden under the table. And now it seems like Jaden will be throwing Polly and Kathy under the table. Jaden's going to try and be like, no, it was all the couple. Mm. I don't know what is going on. The couple. It's like Bonnie and Clyde masterminds. And I am just like a bystander to it. That's the speculation of how people think that it will play out in trial. I'm not sure how Polly will be approaching this case with his attorney. I guess we will just have to wait and see how the trial goes. And again, just to clarify, we don't know the absolute facts of this case yet. We have a supposed motive. We have a supposed theory, but we don't know the exact reason that two individuals' lives were cut short and exactly who was involved in what. But it has been a huge relief for the victim's families that the fugitives were caught. James's family said, we are thankful that we had James walk with us for the past 37 years. He's our sunshine and is now our shooting star out there in the greater universe, shaking things up. God will take him in the fold of super angels. Dana's father said, it's so hard to grasp that he was just visiting a friend in Houston. He didn't even live there and he was murdered. Dana's stepmother emotionally stated, he did nothing wrong. He walked in at, in the wrong door at the wrong time, and it has devastated our family. Dana's dad said, For five and a half months, I prayed for them to be caught every day. I'd like to meet the woman that's the head of the Fugitive Task Force next time I come to Texas, so that I can shake her hand, and if she'd allow me, I'd buy her a steak. Yeah. He went on to state that his son Dana was one of the better human beings that you would ever meet. 
He said, we had a lot in common and now that's gone and he's gone and I don't know how to make up for that. And that is the very viral case of how a TikToker is allegedly involved in a double homicide. This has been highly requested. Um, yeah, it's just everything is kind of up in the air, though. Please let me know in the comments, what are your thoughts on this case? Did you watch Kathy Vu's TikToks before all of this happened? Were you a viewer of hers? Let me know and please stay safe. I will see you guys on Wednesday for the main episode. Bye.